blood has three parts. It has white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. The white blood cells are there to help in fight infections. The red blood cells carry oxygen throughout the body, and the platelets help us clot. So when there, uh, when there's an abnormality in the white blood cell, specifically the lymphocyte, that can become a lymphoma. And there's basically a series of genetic changes that happen that make those cells start making copies of themselves, plus they don't die after a normal lifespan. So in CLL, the cell that develops those mutations is specifically called a B cell. It's a part of the normal immune system that is born in the bone marrow, travels around in the, in the blood, and then can take up residence either in the lymph nodes or the spleen, and it helps our body fight infection. So CLL occurs when there are mutations in those B cells that accumulate, and as a result, they start growing, and they don't die after a normal lifespan. So CLL is marked by the accumulation of these cells, and it results in a high white blood cell count when you check your blood. It can result in big lymph nodes. Sometimes they're found in the neck or under the arms, in the groin, um, but there are also lots of lymph nodes internally. And then it can also result in a big spleen. And those are kind of some of the ways that people can come to attention with CLL and be diagnosed. So often when we see people in our office, they tell us that they went to their primary doctor for their routine physical, got blood work, and it showed a high white blood cell count. And some people even have high white blood cell counts that have kind of been around for years, and then suddenly it's just their doctor notices that it hasn't gone away on multiple blood checks, and that's when they're referred to us as hematologists or oncologists. And often what we do is we take the blood and we do something called flow cytometry or immunophenotyping. And that's a specific test where we take the blood and we look at the proteins on the surface and we sort all the white blood cells out. And through that process, we're able to identify if a cell looks like CLL. And when it looks like CLL and it's above a certain threshold in the blood, then we call it CLL. Occasionally, people also have big lymph nodes and that's the reason that they go to see their doctor. They notice that the lymph nodes in their neck or in their, their armpits haven't really gone down in the way that they would expect. And occasionally, we can do a lymph node biopsy and find CLL cells there as well. So often when people are diagnosed, our first step is to enter a period of observation or watch and wait. And this can be a, an interesting time for patients because they get a new cancer diagnosis and then we say we're not going to treat it right away, we're going to watch you over time. And while we understand that that can be um, counterintuitive, we have a lot of data, several studies, to suggest that treating CLL early doesn't alter outcomes for people. So people don't live longer by treating earlier, um, and they probably don't live better either. So what we do is we wait until there are one of five things happening. So the first two um, symptoms that we look for are a low hemoglobin or anemia, or low platelets or thrombocytopenia. The third is big or bulky lymph nodes. And they can either be bothersome because people don't like how they look, or they have some discomfort in those lymph nodes, or they're just in an inconvenient spot and causing some dysfunction in other organs, like the liver or the kidneys. The fourth is a big spleen. And the spleen is an organ that sits under the ribs on the left-hand side. And people can either feel some discomfort under the left ribs or notice that they're getting full early. And the reason that that happens is that the stomach and the spleen take up the same space. So as the spleen grows, the stomach gets kind of squished. And as a result, people can take a few bites and really just not feel like eating after that. And then the fifth is what we call B symptoms or systemic symptoms. And those are things like fevers or chills, night sweats where you're waking up drenched and having to change your pajamas. Um, weight loss without trying, or fatigue, and that can be anywhere from mild to profound. And if people have one of those symptoms, we typically think it's time to start treating the CLL, because at that point, the um, risks of therapy are outweighed by the benefits, because people will start to feel better as we correct those symptoms. So often, the first treatment that we reach for now for a lot of our patients is called a brutinib. It's a pill that you take once a day for as long as your work, it's working.
Venetoclax is a drug that we often reach for when ibrutinib has stopped working. And it's a very effective drug that kills the CLL cells quickly. And as a consequence, one of the side effects of venetoclax is development of tumor lysis syndrome, which is really just a consequence of these cells breaking open quickly and releasing all of their contents into the bloodstream. And if that happens, it can actually result in kidney damage. So part of taking venetoclax is that for the first five weeks, while the dose is going from a low dose to the normal 400 milligram dose that people will continue from that point forward, they're watched very closely. And that can either be in the outpatient or the inpatient setting, but it requires frequent blood checks and lots of IV hydration, either by mouth or by IV. We have three classes of drugs right now that are considered novel agents that are approved. The first are BTK inhibitors, and that's specifically a brutinib. That's often the first pill we reach for. The second is called a BCL2 inhibitor, or venetoclax. And the third is a class of drugs called PI3K inhibitors. And those drugs are idelalisib and duvalisib. Those are all FDA approved. We also have immunotherapy, which is often delivered by IV. Those are anti-CD20 antibodies. What those do is they help the body kind of find the CLL cells and it helps bring the immune system in to attack those CLL cells. Coming down the pipeline, we have lots of different versions of immunotherapy as well as more targeted agents, which are often pills. And then there are also more drugs in those three classes that we talked about. So it's an exciting time in CLL because we have a lot of drugs that are in development and promising for the future. Our first therapy is often ibrutinib, and ibrutinib is a pill that works for months to years for most people and even longer for, some, for a subset of people. Once we think ibrutinib isn't working anymore, we call that relapsed CLL, meaning that it's come back after a person has received a therapy. And in that setting, we have other pills that can be very effective. So often the second one we reach for is venetoclax, which is a drug that attacks the CLL cells and causes them to die pretty quickly. So that's a pill that um, is typically very safe and very well tolerated. But in the beginning, because it's so effective at killing the CLL cells, often if patients have high white blood cell counts or big lymph nodes, we bring them into the hospital and very carefully watch their blood salts to make sure that they're not developing any kidney injury from that process. Um, we also have other medications approved like idelalisib or duvalisib, and those are available too for patients who have relapsed or refractory disease. So a lot of the drugs that have been developed and approved in CLL in the last five to six years were all available by clinical trial before they were approved. So often some very exciting, very effective drugs are still in the clinical trial phase and by participating in trials, patients can have early access to those drugs. So there are frontline clinical trials, meaning for patients who are going to be treated for the first time. And then there are also clinical trials for people with relapsed or refractory disease. So clinical trial participation isn't for everyone, but certainly for patients who are interested, it's, it represents a great opportunity to really experience a new therapy, potentially with fewer side effects than those that we have approved. And also it um, offers the opportunity to, to give to other CLL patients by, by participating in trials. We really um, learn a lot more about the disease and about what therapies are gonna be effective in the future. So often when people are newly diagnosed, they do enter a period of observation where we see them in the clinic every three months. We check blood counts and do a physical exam and make sure that they're not developing any new symptoms. And that can be a period that really is associated with a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety. So we often encourage our patients to reach out to other CLL patients through patient support groups or advocacy groups, and LRF is an excellent resource for that. It's hard to take a new diagnosis, a new cancer diagnosis into your life and not feel like you're doing anything. So I think that process of really finding a community can be very helpful. This affects people in different ways. For some people, it's less stressful than others, but talk to your doctor and make sure that if you are 
kind of in this period of new diagnosis and you're finding it to be very anxiety provoking or stressful, that you're really reaching out for resources because there are a lot of great resources out there. This is a very exciting time in CLL in that whereas we used to use chemoimmunotherapy or drugs that really made people sick and feel like they were getting chemo, we now have targeted agents that have different side effects than, than the original chemotherapy drugs. But a lot of drugs have been approved in the recent past and a lot of drugs are coming so we'll have even more drugs in the near future. And I think all of these treatment options make it a disease where we can really customize with patients and make sure that they're being treated in the best possible way. So I think working with your doctor to really come up with your individualized treatment plan is an important piece of CLL, but it can become a disease that you live with for many, many years. I think that's a great point of hope.